Perfectly shot arrow goes kershunk as it hits the bullseye of an archery target. The baseball cracks off the bat and heads over for the fence for a home run. There's a splash in the lake as a kid cannonballs off the high dive. These are the sounds of summer camp. And if you love talking about summer camp, there is no better place to do it than right here at the Happy Camper Live podcast. And I am your head counselor, Steve Slavkin. And we are the center of all things summer camp. I spent many, many years at summer camp. And uh, at, uh, at Happy Camper Live, we, uh, we like to talk to guests, we like to talk to very special people. And one of those special people is a, is a friend of mine, is someone I met at summer camp when I was working on Happy Camper Live and I was doing the series. And he is a great guy. His name is David Weinstein. And DW, as he is known, those are his initials, he is a professional musician, a composer. Uh, he has done some amazing work in theater and he has spent a lot of his life in the theater and he is, um, uh, he teaches music at Happy Camper Live and he's done some really incredible work. Uh, DW is also a, a teacher who has uh, taught on the college level and uh, he's recently married and he is a fantastic guy and he is in Nashville right now at his home studio. And I want to welcome my pal, DW. DW, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm, I'm really well. It's, it's good. Uh, uh, I am, I'm happy to be here. It's, it's good to see you. Now, DW, how do you, how do you and I really know each other? I mean, where, where do we meet up? Um, I, I, I think our first meeting had to been over chicken wings because we both have a a fond love of of hot wings. Um, That's true. And in the lovely town of Starlight, Pennsylvania, there's no shortage of of hot wings. And I think we've tried every available place to try them. And uh, that's absolutely correct. You and I have shared many hot wings. I mean, I feel sorry for the chicken for the chicken population of uh, of that of that area. <laughs> so, DW, uh, you have been on Happy Camper Live. You've been a um, uh, you were a music counselor. Yes. For, uh, for for and how did you? How did you get there? Tell us, tell us your um, your journey to becoming a music counselor at Happy Camper Live. Oh my goodness! Well, I I mean, not to get into way too much detail, but um, being a professional musician, um, I just and mixing it with my world of summer camp just kind of naturally gravitated me towards um, you know doing whatever I could to assist in being a, a music counselor um, for Happy Camper. Right, so you've been you've been at summer camp for a very long time. As yes. a kid, where did you go to camp? Um, I went to a, a camp called Frenchwoods Performing Arts Camp. And what did you what did you do there? How was your experience at Frenchwoods? I was fun. I I had a great time back in those days. I uh, I was on stage performing, singing, um, and then I sort of naturally went down to the pit to play music because I. Uh, the inner perfectionist in me was always like, why are you going to let them get away with singing that bad? And so <laughs> I would jump down in the pit and my, uh, my teachers would be like, okay, you snot nosed kid, what can you do? And then right. I would sort of jump in there and say, let's try this and let's try that. It sort of um, burst my love of, of all things music and theater. Um, but that's how it kind of sort of started. So your so 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 really sort of one of your 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 first experiences in in theater was at summer camp, right? Oh yeah. When you yeah, that's where you sort of developed your love for for theater. Now I see behind you you have many many keyboards, and I know that you happen to be a uh, a, 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 maestro, a, a master of the keyboard. Uh, how many years have you been studying the keyboard? Um, well, here's an interesting factoid: um, I've never taken lessons on on the keyboard. I uh, I started out playing the violin. And my fingers got too chubby for them. So I went to the cello <laughs> <laughs> and I really loved the cello until about seventh or eighth grade when my music teacher said, you know, if you're interested in the double bass, I'll give you some extra points on your report card. And me being me, I was like, okay. And I, I just sort of um, 
you know, really loved it, became pretty good at it, ended up taking lessons at, a, at one of the teachers at Juilliard in New York City. And off I was to become a double bass player of all things. And then um, during my summers at camp. And a double I, bass, is the, that's the stand-up bass, That's right? the big one. Yeah, the big one. Right. right. Um, and then during my summers at camp, um, I would basically take the um, take different books because I knew how to read music. And I would sort of figure out how the fingerings worked for piano and how to read the music. And I just practiced hour after hour after hour after hour. And uh, flash forward to, you know, 30 years later and, and I'm doing it professionally. Now, w w professionally, you've got a, uh, I mean, you, you've, you've, you've had quite an interesting career in music. I mean, professionally, what, you know, where have you performed and, and, and then what is your writing career, your musical writing career? Where has that taken you? Um, well, you know, I, as I'm not a, I'm not a shy person and I think that really kind of helped me um, land, as we say in the business, landing gigs. Um, right. um, I think, you know, my fir I, as soon as I left undergraduate school and I went to University of Miami in Florida, I went straight to New York City. I was actually on my way to LA to pursue writing for movies. And during that summer, I was at camp and I met some folks who worked at a company in New York called Music Theater International. And I liked it so much, I just kind of begged them for a job, kind of pulled on their shoulder and said, give me a job, give me a job, give me a job. <laughs> I, and uh, I'm still friendly and I still work well, with them. Well, explain what they do. Uh, music Theater International licenses musicals around the world. So anytime you see a show like Guys and Dolls or any of the Disney library or any of um, you know the big musicals, if you want to perform one, you have to license it through Music Theater International. And um, this was at a time when they were creating the Broadway Junior Series. And the Broadway Junior Series was, you know, shows cut down to, for an, uh, to an hour and performable by kids. And it was just a natural thing for me being at camp. We were piloting some of these new shows at, at uh, French Woods. And that sort of all came together at the same time. So it's good timing. And of course, me being a nudge about like, uh, somebody hire me, somebody hire me. So I ended up foregoing my L.A. dreams for a few years and I worked in New York and um, I uh, worked at Music Theater International. And on the side, I was trying to get um, other gigs. And luckily enough, through my connections at uh, MTI, I met the um, the Broadway team at Les Mis, um, Les Miserables. And I ended up um, at one point, oh gosh, I don't remember what year it was, but I ended up conducting the Broadway show for about four months. And it was like, you know, for a 22, 23 year old, it was, I was on the high of a lifetime. It was pretty incredible. I mean, that must have been an awesome experience it, to, it to stand in the pit at Les Mis because that is a big show. That's yeah. a lot of responsibility. It, it, it certainly was. And let me tell you, I was not nervous. I was ner I'm sorry. I was nervous every single performance. Uh, there were, I think, 40 per month or something like that. And I did over 100. And every single time I was nervous, even though the, most of the musicians kind of did their own thing. They knew what they, they knew what they were doing. I was, I felt like I was there for show, but it still was a big responsibility. And, you know, I remember it fondly. It was an amazing experience. Did you play in the show as well? I did not, which is usually not the way it works. Usually you end up, you know, playing um, keyboard and you become the associate conductor and then you get moved up. It just so happened that I met with the music supervisor who's in charge of all of the productions and all of the music staff and um, got to be friendly with that person. And it, it worked out that the current conductor wasn't able to do the show, had to leave town and the associate wasn't ready to go. So mm -hmm. I knew the show since it came out in 1989, like the back of my hand. I, I've seen it probably 17 times before I even walked in the Imperial Theater. It's a tremendous there. show. Yeah. The music is is phenomenal. Yeah. So I I um, you know, I guess they felt that I was very natural for it. So I jumped in there and and got the job done for those four months. So when you you know, as as a guy working for the theater company who's cutting down the shows for uh, a kid audience, what do you look for? Like what kind of transformation actually has to go through when you take a sometimes a more adult show and cut it down for kids. What are the things that you look for or things that you do? 
Well, it's it's like anything else. It, it comes from a storytelling point of view. Um, remember that we are creating these shows for kids to be the performers, not for the audience. The audience is the same audience that would see the same show that happened on Broadway or on tour or even at your local church or synagogue. Um, I think, you know, the first thing to see is how we look, look at a show and there are some sort of what we call gimmies right away that that say, oh, they put this song in act two because they needed to float more time right. because, you know, that person needed to change, uh, change clothes. Something like that, I believe, as academic as it sounds, is, is the truth. So um, we do try to keep them all down to an hour, keep all the favorite hits, make sure that they're dramaturgically, they, they you know, have a beginning, middle and end. And, um, you know, it doesn't happen just at the conference room table. You have to try them. You have to work it all out. You have to, and then we look at the music and, and say, wow, that is way too high for a kid to sing. So we right. need to adjust that. And then we work with the authors and say, hey, we're doing this version and we have a pilot that is going to do it somewhere. And uh, we'd like you to come out and see it and see and have some notes for us. And they give us their notes and we, we just keep kind of moving forward. It takes about a year or two before things are ready to go out into the marketplace before we you know, record the music and get all the materials ready. And what's fascinating is probably, you know, lots of kids who are listening to this podcast right now have probably been in shows that you've done and sung the songs that you have, uh, uh, you know, Edited. recomposed or, yeah. or, 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 or arranged. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been an amazing uh, process with the Broadway Junior because there are some shows that I actually got to orchestrate, which is to say, you know, taking all the different instruments and making them, um, you know, putting them all together to be the accompaniment that they sing to. And also, you know, little little known secret, um, I I do have a couple cameos on some of the recordings, which is really fun for me because I I'm not like a super great singer, but I, enough that I can do a character voice. Or I got to do the Les Mis High School version, and I was a voice on that. So that's really a lot of fun to do when I get those opportunities. So you send out the soundtrack as well. I mean, they, have, they have the option of using the soundtrack or they must use the soundtrack? No, um, they have the option. We don't offer the orchestrations because that's a whole different process. We, we want them to be able to have access to the full recording as the original authors intended. So we record oh. it for them in the new key and the new edits and everything. Or they, um, you know, some people that are a little more savvy, they'll take the piano vocal score and do piano, bass and drums or something, some version of that. Depending on the school or program, they, they have more resources than others. But we wanted to make it sort of across the board. You can use this if you want. This is available for you. It's, it's really fascinating because I, I, I know that so many kids get their start in, at, at the summer camp theater and be, being on the stage, is can be the, the highlight of somebody's life and it can propel them in such interesting directions. So um, obviously being on the theater has propelled you in some interesting directions as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you've also gone on to be from, from a composer. You've also gone on to study music and to get a, a master's degree, right? Yes. And, and to teach as well. Yes. So t why did you decide to go back and, and do those things? And, and what kind of goals were you... Uh, looking to achieve by going back to school? Um, you know, one was was purely... And so where, do you, where did you go? Uh, I went to a school here in Nashville called Belmont University. And my master's degree is in um, what's... <laughs> it sounds so silly when I say it out loud. Commercial uh, composition and arranging. And the buzzword in the academic world for commercial means anything like jazz or anything that's contemporary. Um, anything that that's being produced as opposed to the classical world or a conservatory world where you're studying to be a classical or concert fill in fill in the name here fill in the instrument here right um but i think um i i got the degree for two reasons um number one was because i wanted to legitimately um at, at the time i wanted to legitimately sort of um, be more of a, a, a professor role. And um, I think I, I went into that thinking this would be great if, because I've done a lot of teaching as, as what they call staff. And 
because I also work at summer camp, I can't do both. So the staff position allows my flight schedule to be a lot more flexible. Um, right. But so I got it for that reason. And also because- and what level are you teaching? Uh, it's college level. It's all um, universities that are in the area. And I go and I work on a musical with the students and you know, I'll teach them vo vocal lessons and vocal coaching, which is a different sort of art form. Um, you know, what what's a good song for them? What's good for their, what they call the book? You know, having a lot of people think that, you know, you just have a bunch of songs that you sing well, and there's a real science and art to it. And when I get to sit on the other side of the table, when I'm auditioning people for my uh, professional engagements, it's nice to be able to say, hey, what do you have from fill in an author here and they go, oh, here you go. I'm ready to go. That That's a good feeling knowing that someone, if it's not me, has taught them properly. Right. Yeah. Now, do you know, are those, are most of these kids, and they're, they're kids, I mean, you know, they're, they're like they're in their twenties, I assume, right? <laughs> yeah. So, right. They're not really kids. So to me, they're kids at this point. Um, are, are these, are these uh, first year students? Are these Kids who have a lot of experience, is there, is there a certain range? Is there, some, is, is there one group that you like more than another? Um, you know what? I, I, it's been really nice to work with. Um, so in the academic theater world, they're called BFAs, uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts. And those are the kids that are, sorry, I said kids too. Um, those are the students that are really studying hard to go out into the world and be you know, um, professional actors, whether they work in an amusement park or Disney, hopefully soon, um, or Broadway or touring. There is a lot of work out there for performers. And, um, you, you know, you think, you think, oh, either they got it or they don't. And, and there's some, there's some truth to that, but anybody who's made it to that level works their butt off to get all of those things right, to get the dancing right, to, to learn how to be a human being. That's a big part of it um, to learn how to be in a professional engagement, how to, you know, um, and then of course the, the art of performing, singing, acting, all that stuff. So these, these are, are really great students. And one school I work at, um, the, the kids are so focused and they're so, um, they're so grateful to be in that position. And then at another university, it's, it's sort of the same thing. They're, um, but it's a different kind of program. That program is a little bit more, uh, um, it's not as high intensity, but it's it's getting there. So so they're building this program that's become wonderful. And, um, you know, they blame me. They're like, they say to me, that's part of, you're part of the reason why we're doing, you know, we're getting more intense and we're getting better. And I appreciate that because I, I have a very high expectations when it comes to my students and I want them to be the best that they possibly can be. And, you know, sometimes I'll just go at them and go at them and then they'll have a breakthrough. And then, you you know, you you say, don't take it personally. I love you. You got this. And then they get it and they realize, like, I got it. It's like working out, you know, all of a sudden you have muscles. You never knew right. you had. <laughs> right. So it's like, you know, it's officer and gentlemen. They, they, they don't like you to start with, but they learn to love you. They learn to respect you. Yeah. I, I'm never mean, but I'm tough. And, and I think they That's appreciate okay. that. Um, what are some of the, you know, so, sort of some of the, the, the life lessons that you, you take from learning music or what, what is, you know, sort of beyond the, the, the skill of playing, how do you apply those things to say another, even another field, you know, I mean, what, what does somebody break, take, take from music lessons or the study, the, the rigor uh, of music and how do they apply that to the rest of their life? I mean, so, you know, someone say someone doesn't want to be a, a full-time musician. Yeah. I, I would say probably almost half to even more uh, students that, that go to school for music or theater don't end up working as full-time musicians. I mean, maybe in their first few years, but, but it's a really good question. And I think it, it definitely spills over into the rest of the real world because when you're studying music or theater or art or any or dance, there's a there's an intensity, there's a focus, and you learn how to do that from from studying and working at something really hard. And a lot of students lose sight of the fact that they're you know they're learning to be great guitar players, but also they're, the process of them learning that also gets them to um, gets them to work hard on no matter what they do. 
people ask me, why did you get your master's degree all the time? They're like, don't you know, like all this stuff? And I said, yeah, I knew a great deal about it. But what I didn't know was how to approach issues that came up. I had to write a, I ended up writing a 475 page thesis, which was unheard of in, <laughs> for a master's degree, right? Because most of it is a, like, a, that's a doctoral dissertation. Um, right. And, but the way you go about it is something that you can't take away from that education. And even, and you know, at, at, um, at, at the summer camp that I work at, I don't, I'm not doing master's thesis. I'm not writing, I'm not writing um, musical scores. I'm not playing music. I'm not doing any of that stuff, but it all helps me to think of how to solve problems. So I think that spills over to all of the artistry that you, you're you learning as a student. You, you get to learn how to focus and you almost learn how to rethink problems that no matter what you end up doing, that's really going to help you. You know, I, I went to film school and I, my, my son is studying liberal arts. And I, I think what I got out of my education was studying film is that it, everything sort of is built on something else. And, you, and as you as you move forward, you have to look backwards and you have to you have to learn about history and you have to learn about people and you have to learn about where your singular problem fits in with in, in, in the big picture. And so you have to learn about so many different things in order to solve that one problem. So if you're writing a, if you're writing a song, you have to have traveled, you have to have lived life, you have to have had yeah. emotion, you had to have passion and, and success and failure, and you have to be able to synthesize all those things and make it palatable or acceptable or 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 or, or confrontational, however it is. But you have to you have to you have to be able to develop an emotion so that an audience can respond to you, and they have to be you have to figure out a way to to get your message across in, in the simplest way. Sometimes I don't even, sometimes I can't do that. <laughs> sometimes I just, sometimes it's a sometimes it's rambling. But the point is you have to learn how to boil it down and you have to uh, make it effective. Yes. And I think that's, and I think that's what you can do in music is that you can, you, you take the message of love and you compress, compress it into a three minute song. Yes, that, that is true. And it's also why there isn't, a, um, you know, not everybody is commercially successful because they don't, know how to take that message and make it universal. And, and, you know, some people will write a song and it's, it may be a great song, but it doesn't speak to the majority of people, but it doesn't mean it's not a great song. It, it's still just, it's how that person expresses themselves. And I think that is also important because commercial success doesn't necessarily equate to, um, you know, success in what you do, no matter what that is. So what was your master's thesis? Uh, you, had, you, had, you had a very interesting project. I did, I yeah. Like I, yeah. I mean, um, I, mean I, I found, I, when you told me about this project, I was actually fascinated by it. Did you ever watch it? No. No, why would I? <laughs> you, uh, yes, you showed it to me. I saw it. No, you didn't. I didn't sit I there did. and show you 42 minutes of it. <laughs> you didn't show me 42 minutes. You showed me a clip of it. Okay, right. Yeah, so... Um, so here was the, I, I was getting down to two different options. Um, I was going to create a radio drama and, um, you know, basically a simple story that I was going to do all the sound effects, dialogue, um, and music for, or, and then the other option was, um, the, the one I ended up choosing was I took an old silent film and I basically recreated an audio spectrum for it. So I, um, kind of took the original shooting script, which had a lot of great ideas. And back then what they would do is they put in these- and what things, was the film? Uh, the film was called The Lost World. And The Lost World was the sort of precursor to Jurassic Park and all the, it was the first claymation dinosaur movie. It was- uh, What year was this? 1925. 1925 yes. silent film. Yeah. It was the precursor to-, to Jurassic Lost Park. World. Yeah. And the yeah, Lost Jurassic World. Park. There's been many, many different versions of the Lost World. Um, and it was two years before uh, sound to picture came out. So it was close, but it was at the time one of the most expensive movies that ever was made back in 1925. And what did you do? What was your process in so, all of this? And so what was the inspiration? The inspiration was simple. It was telling a good story. And, you know, no matter what you did, you're still looking at a picture. And, um, you know, I was able to create a whole audio backdrop to it to bring it to life. And while the picture was great, 
even though it was done in black and white or at the time um, they used t- tints. Um, right. They hand, they they hand tinted, tinted the picture. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. And there was a, that was a, you know, another, like you said, you have to know about history and you had to research all that stuff. And that was really, really fascinating. Um, so the, uh, so what I did was I started with looking at it and back then they used to put in these little things called title cards and the title cards would kind of tell you what happens next. You know, you'd see like, Oh no, Oh dear. There's a damsel in distress. And then, you know, you'd right. have that sort of funny music that was played live at the time. Um, so that, you know, the audience got a, a good feel for emotional feel for what was happening w- along with the picture. But I didn't have to do that obviously, cause I was, doing a recording. Um, so what I did was I followed, I followed the script. I, I sort of cut it down just like I would for a Broadway junior show. And then I started just really piecing together how it would all work. Um, I would create a bunch of sound effects and not just any sound effects. I'd have to, it took place part of, part of it took place in London. So I'd have to make sure that the street sounds that I made were actually sounds of London not just, wow. you know, anything. Or if you hear a train in the background, it's got to be the trolley from 1925. And it's, you know, um, I had a, there's a sound effect. Right, of, so you had to do it. You had to do a deep dive. Oh, yeah. Into, big time. Into, into history. Big time. Big time. And, and then it came to uh, recording dialogue, which I had to create a bunch of it because in back then in the shooting script, even though they had a script so that the actors knew what they were saying, they kind of made up, they, they kind of um, paraphrased things. They didn't say what was in the script. They're like, oh, it seems that you are, you know, you're, you're hurting. And the line might have been like, oh, darling, um, I hope you're not upset, you know? So right. they would paraphrase. So I had to try to follow their little mouth movements and make up my own words and also be careful about what they said in 1925 and also make sure that my actors could do it in, in a British accent. I had a friend of mine who helped coach the British accent. Wow. And then I also had somebody from uh, Brazil. <laughs> so I had to make sure I had a coach that could help me with the Brazilian accent. That was later in the film. Wow. So I, and how I, long did this whole process take for you? Oh, boy. Uh, I would say it took about uh, four months total. Four wow. to six months. So you were doing sound effects. So you're like an old fashioned sound effects guy too. So you're like, you know, it's thunder and you're shaking the. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, they call them Foley artists. And um, it was made by a guy. um, I forgot his first name, but his last name was Foley. And he was the first guy to do that. And that was back Mm in the 19 teens. And um, Mm -hmm. yeah, as a matter of fact, that's a lot of the sound effects um, I pulled from libraries, but other ones you have to recreate because they don't have stuff like that anymore. So you had to recreate it. And I did all kinds of clever things like a, a bookshelf that moved. I used a cardboard coffee cup and recorded it and manipulated the sound to make it give it that depth. So, you know, a lot of that sort of science and, and uh, think that I had to do to make it sound it's, authentic. It, it's, it's fascinating. It yeah. really is. It's, it's, it's really incredible. I mean, I, uh, and, and to also at the same time, write a 450 page Right. document to, to support this is, is really crazy. Well, the easiest part of the whole thing to me was actually writing the music because although, you know, the, 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 the important part of music and storytelling is to tell, help tell the story, whether you're fighting against it, you don't want to give it away to the audience, or you just want to support the emotion that's happening on the screen. To me, that was the easiest part because I tried to use a contemporary technique, but also bear in mind that everything that was happening on screen was very sort of melodramatic. So you wanted to not go crazy with the melodrama and the music, but just support what was happening. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the easier part. Um, the, the dialogue and the, and the sound effects were the, the sort of, um, you know, the academic part, which was really a lot of fun, but difficult at the same time. So you, so you've been, um, at summer camp for like 28 years now. Yes. Well, I've worked you know, there. You, you've worked at summer camp for 28, yeah. 28 years, but you've really, you've really been a, you're like a, a, a lifer. I, I, it's, it, and what, it's do you, what do you, what did you, what do you, what do you love about summer camp? Uh, you, well, I, I guess. Or do I, you love anything about summer camp yeah, at this point? point. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, I, I'll say like from, from a, 
from a an employer employee point of view, it's it's a it's it's just a great energy and it's a great um way to solve problems and um you know it's so funny in my real life when I'm not at camp, people like freak out over the smallest things and you're like don't worry about it, do this you know in an hour at camp no big deal, and and that's kind right. of a neat thing to be able to say and do is like you know if I I used to, um, when I did live in, in Los Angeles, I worked on film sets and people would be freaking out over the dumbest things. And you'd be like, nope, I got it. Don't worry. Well, you take the, if it's taking the long view, it's, yeah. uh, you, 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 you realize that it's, it's summer. Uh, everyone's there to help you. You're going to, you've got people who've got your back. They want to support you and yeah. you're, you're surrounded by friends. It's, there's nothing like it. Yeah. It was uh, as a camper, it was, Super fun because I was with, you know, other campers that did the same stuff I did. So it was like you had this constant feeling of like you are all you're all going to go out and make it as whatever you wanted it to be. And then as you know, as a counselor, you're kind of like helping this, this new batch of kids that you were just that you were their age just a few years ago. And then now as as an administrator, you're watching these kids grow up and you're kind of like helping them get to their next level. And that's kind of fun. And, and it then becomes not only the campers, but their staff too. You're watching these guys who, um, you know, we, I've got can name, you know, tens of, tens of guys and girls that came as staff and they, and uh, they learned this new technique or new skill. And now they're doing it professionally in their life because of camp. Right. Camp, camp definitely provides you an incredible opportunity to, to try things. You can, you can try them and like them or try them and, and not like them. And that's okay. Yes. That's, actually, that's actually part of the, the beauty of summer camp is the, uh, you know, it's a buffet. You can take what you like and you leave what you don't like, you know, right. You know, yeah. I have, I happen to, you know, like, like tapioca, I mean, I would, don't necessarily wouldn't take that, but I'll take the chocolate pudding instead. You know? <laughs> We call that uh, dirt sorry. pudding at, at camp when you put a little Oreos in the chocolate. Oh, so Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah, dirt pudding. Uh, if, what's your favorite camp meal? Oh my gosh, um, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 mine was always London broil and French fries. This, uh, that was special, very special night. London yeah, broil. well, I think it's really hard to say because you know now as the guy who runs the food service. I'm more happy serving the food and I don't really think about what, what I like. And I happen to be like a foodie. So like camp food is not really, even though we do such a, a nice job at doing such a very various different meals and stuff, I don't really ever think about it. And, and the chicken wings at camp are not quite the ones that you and I got. Right. So, right. Yeah. Actually the food at your camp was very good. I was actually really impressed. Uh, the chef was excellent. Um, if I had gotten the food in a restaurant, I'd be very happy. So, uh, you know, good. that's off to him and, and to you for putting it all together. That's, that's good. That's what we, that's what we want to go for. It's true. Honestly, it's the food's actually really good. Um, what else? I mean, we're, we're, uh, the, the campfire is burning low here and, um, I want to make sure that we get everything in, in, can you tell us what, uh, what, what comes next for you? I mean, you, you've been a music counselor, happy camper live. You taught, uh, you taught drums and you taught piano. Uh, so you gave, you gave, you gave people rhythm, you gave people the ability to, to sing. Uh, did you, did you enjoy your experience at Happy Camper Live? Yeah, very much. It was, it was fun. It was, uh, you know, it's, a, it's always a lot of pressure when you're, you're in the hot seat, but, um, it is fun and you, you hope that, that, uh, campers can sort of take away what you're trying to give them. But it, it's funny, you know, people who do what I do. There's a lot of prep work and, you know, there's this whole thing about, well, why do you pay musicians so little money? What happens to all of the schooling and the prep time? And, you know, I have a, I have a, a gig coming up in February and I've been rehearsing for it for weeks now. And there's a lot of prep that goes into it. So, you know, even at, at, at Happy Camper Live, it looks like, oh, and here you go. And now you're going to play the guitar and now you're going to play the ukulele and, it, it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of, you know, piece by piece putting it together. And it is very true. The more you practice, the, the better you get. 
Uh, you have been an, an uh, really sort of an incredible pillar of summer camp for, for so many years. You are uh, musically talented. You are a great guy. You are friendly. You are really good at what you do. You have you you run, uh, you know, uh, uh, you help run a camp with a thousand, you know, basically a thousand people in there. And you do it with with such ease and charm, and you you know how to make people feel good. And I've 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 seen you do it, and 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 I know and I know that there, there's definitely, you know, it can be definitely difficult at times, but you somehow make it all seem so easy. And that's just like what it's like in a Broadway show or as a composer, is that you know there's there's a million details, but you seem to pull it off with with such ease. So DW, you know. There are probably a lot of kids from Happy Camp who want to get involved in music. How, how, what, what do they do? I mean, there's there's so many different avenues. It can be confusing for somebody. Is there, do you have any advice for what they can do? Yeah, of course. I, it, it varies a lot on what type of music you want to pursue. Um, going to school, going to university, college for music is a different thing than wanting to pursue either uh, being a performer on stage or different from someone who wants to be a, you know, necessarily like a touring um, like a pop guitar star. player or a pop star, right. for example. Right. right. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I know I always wanted to be, that's what I always wanted to do. Right. Do, do you think, do you think, do you think I could still it's, do it? It's or never what? too late. Is there a chance? It's, it's never not too, too late. late. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. But, but you get, know. I'll get a pair of leather pants <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> you got to look the part. And dye, and dye my hair. Yes. Whatever it might be. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I always was interested in the academic side of music and how music theory works. And it made a lot of sense for me to follow the path of music school. Um, it is not for everybody. And it is tough for a lot of kids who play an instrument when they're young, because, you know, generally when you're a young person, you practice more, your, your brain is more sort of ready to absorb technique and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I just got on the path, uh, when I was, I don't know, in fourth grade and, uh, my friends and I wanted to do the talent show and we, they wanted to do this like cops and robbers beat, beat up each other thing. And afterwards, everybody left the room and the, the a chorus teacher said, I don't know if we can do that. Do you have anything else? And I, with great big chutzpah said, Oh, I can, I can play a song. And I had <laughs> never touched a piano in my life. I sat at that piano and it made something up right there on the spot. And she's like, that's what you're doing for the talent show. Pretty so, good. yeah, but I, I didn't know what I was you doing. You took advantage of an opportunity. Is yeah, what I happened. did. And that's what you, is that you, did. you were, you were, you were prepared and you, 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 you took advantage of it. I, I don't know that. about the prepared part, but I definitely okay, took advantage. I was, I was giving you a little credit, <laughs> but, um, you know, to me, it was like, well, why does it feel, uh, why does, why does going from one chord to another chord feel like a certain emotion? I, I wanted to know why. And that's mm -hmm. sort of got me on the path of taking proper lessons and taking um, classes in school, uh, you know, in, in um, junior high school and elementary school about music to really understand how the notes worked. And a lot of students do that now. But they have to really figure out like what's the end plan. I have a lot of um, seventeen and sixteen year old um, students that say, "I I got to go to school and I got to get a degree in performance." And I say, "No, you don't, because I promise you, no matter what degree you get, you're going to end up down the path you're meant to do. And if your dream is to be a guitar player with whatever um, the new band is, then that's the dream you pursue. Because there's no one way to get there." There's a lot. You, if, if you, Steve, never went to film school, there's a hundred percent chance you'd be doing something that involved storytelling and film work. Absolutely. You know what's interesting is that you know we talk about being prepared, and the, the the answer is you have to be prepared in so many different ways. And you even you even talked about that, which is you have to be able to present yourself properly. Yeah. And you you have to have knowledge. You can't you can't just you cannot just be a technical musician. Because that's that's all you will ever be as a technical musician. You you will literally just be pressing keys. Right. Is that you need to be able to bring emotion and story, and and a passion to 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 it, and that comes from so many different areas. Right. I, I yeah I I definitely agree. I think like you know your teachers, whoever your teachers are, will sort of shape 
help you shape that. I, I used to get comments that when I was in 10th grade or 11th grade and I was getting ready for college that I was so technical that, that you, I, you know, you play so well, but where's the emotion? And so that was the easier part to go, oh, I'm allowed to do that. And I had no idea because I was so focused on where my fingers go and where the bow goes. And, you know, and then, and then it, it, it opened up the world for me differently. People listen to Bob Dylan sing, and he is not a <laughs> technically perfect singer. <laughs> That's a Neil good way Young, to put it. You know, Neil Young, you know, I mean, they're, the, they don't hit the notes all the time, but they sure sound good. Right. And, yeah. and you, you really want to listen to them yep. because it's because what they have to say. It's not how they necessarily say it. Yeah. That's, that's, there's a lot of, a lot of people like that. And uh, it's just about following your passion and learning as much as you can. Um, there's never one path to that success, no matter what, I, you know, you and I probably know a billion people that went to school for economics, but now they're, you know, major acting stars or they're, you know, Broadway performers or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. It's not always one one way to skin the proverbial cat, as it were. Yes, no, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, what else? What what is it? What's what's what are your future plans? What would you like to do? Where do you see yourself in ten or fifteen years? Oh my gosh, retired! I hope I'm just. <laughs> there's no such thing. <laughs> um, I don't you think know, you'd be happy just sitting around. No, I know you. Well, you wouldn't. We're doing that now, and it's brutal. It's brutal. Right. Right. Um, but you have a lot of keyboards there. I, mean, I see three keyboards. You can only, you can only have two arms. No, so, I, there's, uh, they're just covered up. So I've got one. There's another one here. So this is my this is my main keyboard. And I'm actually working on a track right now. This is a, a new keyboard that's kind of like a programmer thing. This is a um, an analog keyboard. And then I have my fabulous um Fender Rhodes piano, which is like an Ooh. old classic. And this was actually right. made the same year, same week I was born. Oh, wow. I won't say what year that is, but it um, has a seven in front of it. <laughs> then I have a, a Hammond B3 um, emulator keyboard up Ooh. here. And then that. And, and tell people why the Hammond sounds so special. Oh, my God, because it's butter. So. Um, it's, yeah, it's what about uh, the, the, the speaker, the Leslie speaker. Yeah. Right? Well, this is an emulator. It's not the real thing. I wish I had the oh. real thing, but unfortunately there are only a limited amount left in the world and, uh, they're very, very, very expensive and, um, they're not that many left. Um, it's that classic organ sound that you hear. Um, you know, you heard it a lot in the fifties and sixties. That's when they came out. Um, and it's just a very luscious, warm organ sound. Um, it's it's delightful, and I actually use that keyboard a lot on shows because a lot of shows will call for a Hammond sound, and nobody mm-hmm. wants to schlep their B three because it's you know <laughs> the size of a small car. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is my office, and then I have a whole room down the other end of the house. Um, Austin has seen it. <laughs> Um, right. Well, my wife Sarah she calls it the museum. It's a little ridiculous, but I've been it's, collecting. It's pretty for a great. Long. So that so your passion is to collect music and instruments. Well, I like I like in, I like uh, what I like about it is it's they're unique, and I I think that's important to try to find something. You know, I found myself as when I write music for media or for something that's on screen, you find this very familiar voice. But at the same time, you want it to be unique. So like, you know, um, Sarah, my wife, she watches Hallmark Channel all the time. Cool. And I listen to those scores and I'm like, oh, my God, these are so cliche, so cliche with the bells and the Christmas and the this. And then every once in a while you hear some some score and you're like, I'm so happy that they allowed this thing to happen because it's so different and it's fresh and it sounds nice. and you know, to me, it's all about your own voice. So it's nice when c- commercial, um, you know, success meets with your own voice. I like that. Well, it's interesting, interesting you talk about that. When a performer performs, how do they find, you know, where, how, how, do, how do they st- step out and find their own individual voice? Well, how, what would you suggest that they do? Or, or what path would they follow in order to do that? 
I, How do you differentiate yourself? Well, first of all, everybody's a little bit different. And if you try to emulate somebody, you're going to end up failing because you've got to be yourself. However, it doesn't hurt to be able to, you know, a lot of times as a professional, you get grouped in with a certain kind of um, character or look or whatever. Um, you know, we'll find ourselves calling the same type of people back for a certain role. But I think you have to believe in yourself. That's like the big, big thing. So if you believe in your abilities and your talents, there's, there doesn't matter who you are. I mean, you look at some Broadway stars and you're like, you look at them and you're like, really? And then you, you, you see them perform. Um, Mandy Patinkin is a perfect example. He's, um, you know, he's a normal looking dude, but the guy's an insanely incredible performer and, and actor and, you you kind of understand. He lights up the he lights up the stage and he commands attention. Yes, yes. You 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 cannot take. So there are actors who you cannot take your eyes off of. That is very they true. Exude, they exude a sense of confidence. Yep. And that's it, well. It's that also comes from, from sort of a sense. It's, it's not just a false sense of confidence. There's a sense of mastery that they have. Yes. Is that it is it is that they are they are accomplished marksmen. With, with with emotions emotion. and words, and they know how to deliver. Yep, they are. They can walk the tightrope. You know, what's very interesting is, you know, when you go to a circus, the tightrope walker doesn't necessarily come up and walk on the tightrope and show you that he can do it. Is that they they always pretend that they're about to fall, and so yeah. it gives you a sense and it, and it gives you a sense of danger. Yeah, and a lot of these performers give you that, that sense, sense of danger, danger. Is that you never know what's going to happen. There's a, there's a really well-known uh, performer here in Nashville and she has starred in like every, every theater company's musical and every, and until last um, holiday season, I had, I didn't, I was like, I don't get it. Why is she the star of everything? There's so many great performers out there. And then she came to join us at Nashville Children's Theater in one of our shows and she did exactly that. She lit up the stage and you're like, ah, I understand now. And, and it was, you know, she is a, she was a great, she is still an, a great person, humble, you know, we, she and I bonded over our dogs and you realize like everybody's a person, but she just believed in her talent and it shows. And when she gets on stage and she opens her mouth, everybody's eyes and ears go straight to her. And that's, that's the thing about it is, if you believe in what you bring to the table, everybody else will believe it too. Right. It's not just the right. way no, you're, I mean, and, you're and cred. What's interesting is, you know, music is, is, is you know, in, in, your, in your particular world, music is not an, just, just an individual sport. You know, it's a team sport. So, uh, you know, generally you have, to, you have to learn to work well with other, other people. And uh, you, you, have to, you have to learn how to be collaborative and share. And in, in my world, I've been a, I've been a writer. I have always every single project i've ever done when i turn it over to actors or performers or to directors i've i've always been thrilled surprised shocked at how it gets better is because i have to trust people mm -hmm. and they add something to to my work and they almost always make it better not always almost always <laughs> make it better <laughs> And, uh, you know, and it's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling to, to put things out there and to know that you're part of a team and to see how, it, it, how, how the magic, the magic happens and, and, and what benefits come from it. Yeah. You'll also find, I, I think one of the things I also found is it, depending on the kind of person you are spilling over into the world of, let's say you wanted to work for Morgan Stanley, if you have a theater, music, art, film background you're used to working with other people as opposed to sitting in a corner and you know doing your own thing and then all of a sudden you're launched into a team situation and you become the outcast because you don't have that background of working with other people well, I'm a, I'm, you know yeah go ahead it's 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 about you know i mean yours your 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 world my world is about telling stories and you tell it with with an instrument i tell it with words and 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 filmmaking but but business is also telling stories. It's about telling stories on how a product can can change your life or how it can shape your life or what or the story that you need it. Yes. And so if you can tell a story 
uh, in whatever in whatever fashion you can, you will be successful. And so, if you study music and you learn how to tell a story that way, you can. Those are those are easily those are skills that transfer over to the business world, or or uh, 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 and and they're skills that people will be looking for. Right. People people will want to work with you as well, especially if you're able to not only do that side but also be pleasant to be around and right. you know and giving and understanding and you know not was, just that's what that that's that, that's where i needed to work that's what i needed to work on the, <laughs> the, the pleasant i should have figured that out <laughs> well you should have listened to this podcast yeah, i should have my life would have been different <laughs> i would have had a house with a monorail and fountains and you know <laughs> you're on the theme park good <laughs> yeah uh, DW, I want to say thank you for, for joining us. You are a, an incredible guy. You have done such great work musically. You've done great work at summer camp and you have really helped, uh, at happy, happy camper, camper live. live. You are uh, an incredible friend and supporter, and you have helped teach kids not only about music, but about life. And uh, these are really very valuable lessons that, 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 that people can take. And I know that uh, you have worked hard and I know that there is great success for you uh, today and even greater success tomorrow because uh, you are a guy who knows how to dream big. And I know that you work hard and you will get all those dreams. All your musical dreams will come true. It's like in a, like in a Disney show. You know, <laughs> all, your dreams will, all your dreams will come true. Well, DW, thank you. Thank you so much. You're a great guy and it's, it's great to talk to you. It's great to great to see you and great to talk to you. And uh, let's go get some wings. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, we spent some time with DW, uh, an incredible guy. And uh, if you want to hear more talk about summer camp, join us next time on Happy Camper Live. I'm your head counselor, Steve Slavkin, saying join us again at the campfire next time. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>